and I'll introduce the talk, but the idea is, yeah, we're what, like almost two years since GPT-3.5 uh, public uh, availability to all of us. And this AI or the, the world waking up to this generative AI um, kind of birth, right? And then I think, so for me over the past two years, I've been obsessively using AI all day, every day. So I think my average number of session, sessions per day with Chad GPT quad and perplexity and some other tools is probably like 10 to 20 sessions a day. So I've developed the first reflex of the same way that about like 2005, we all developed a reflex of Googling something. When you get your first iPhone, you're like, someone is like arguing about something. They're like, okay, let me Google that. Right. But like now I'm like, let's AI this, I'm use this for all the things that I do. So I still do a fair amount of like data work. So I'm a data practitioner. I, I act very close to the data team at preset, or I'm like a, one of the main actors uh, doing data. I still code. Uh, so the company is small enough and I need this outlet personally. Like if I don't code or commit code to a repository, I don't develop self-worth somehow. So even if I, you know, hire three people and do like three great things as a founder, I still need to, to push code to feel accomplished. It's just a reflex developed over the past 20 years of my career. So, um, and I need this like kind of focus, like deep concentration, which I don't get from many things, um, other than coding. Uh, so I went, to, I don't know if you're familiar with the good, the bad and the ugly, a classic, uh, Western movie, but here I'm doing AI reality checkpoint and try to identify the good, the bad and the overhyped. Um, all of the, this, this stock is obsolete as I give it and I made it yesterday. <laughs> so, so, uh, but, but it is very much my experience with, uh, working with AI, um, over the past two years and what I've found you know, uh, trying all sorts of different things with my first reflex with AI. Um, and something that's really kind of unique, right? If you're like, oh, I'm going to do, I, I'm going to do a talk where I talk about, you know, how airflow works for me. That's kind of a finite thing. The thing with AI is you can use it for, for anything. Like you use it as your personal therapist. You can use it to like help uh, redoing your kitchen. You know, you can use it for design, for like, data visualization suggestion. So it's a very vast plane to explore, but then I, I'm going to try to summarize the things that I've tried and the things that really work and the things that are kind of not quite there yet. Uh, so this is the intro slide. I think, I think I need little introduction. If any place in the world, I'm a, I'm a micro celebrity in this room or in this building one, once a year, uh, I started Apache airflow in 2014, as you cut the story. I'll, like soon after I started Apache Superset, and a lot of people are like, why did you ditch Airflow and go work on Superset? I love things that are visual, interactive. Um, I love to think about UX and design. Um, and I really wanted to go and disrupt the BI industry. Like there, there's no like strong contender in bi and I, I hated uh you know the tools the vendor tools with a passion i'm like we really need a really solid open source um alternative in bi so that's kind of what led me there curious by a show of hand who has used apache superset in the past year actively uh, or actively enough like more than uh, i don't know been uh, mau for a couple months <laughs> but i not a lot of people. So, so the one thing that I'd like for people to, to do, you add to your own work, you should go check out Superset. So Superset is open source BI. It's freaking competitive. It's solid. Uh, if you use Tableau, you probably, you know, have some gripes with your BI, BI vendors. They're expensive. They're not very flexible. They're not very open. Open source BI is here. Like Superset has gotten really good over the past a uh, year, I think we passed some important tipping point. So I would urge you to go and try it. The best way to try it is on preset. We had like a freemium up to five user and a trial. You can try all the, the, the features that we've built. So preset is like hosted Apache superset with bells and whistle, and it's all on the cloud. You can instantiate as many, you know, superset environments as you want, if you so wish. And yeah, it's a great way to kind of try superset, see where it's at for free. So, uh, 
if you feel like it, add that to your, your to-do list or your list of homework to go and check it out and see how much, uh, open source has caught up in the business intelligence field. Cool. So this is uh, the, the agenda for today. There's quite a bit of things to talk about. There's a little bit of like how we got here in terms of like AI getting to this tipping point. I'm not going to go too deep into that. It's, it's been talked about. I already talked about my AI first reflex. I wanted to mention that. I also want to urge people to develop that reflex. If you care about how the world is evolving and to remain a, a relevant, up-to-date data professional or really that applies to every career, but you should develop that first reflex of using AI all day, every day. I mean, until, until someone's like, it's a problem, <laughs> you do too much. But uh, that is a really good thing to do, not only to understand how AI is changing the world, but just to be more productive. Wherever there's a productivity boost, you should, you should grab it, catch it. Yeah, and those are the people that are going to do well over the next five or 10 years. People figure out how to best leverage the shifting monster that is AI and use it best at any given point in time. And then what I'm going to do today is like decompose some of the use cases or the perspective of like some areas where, I, where I've used AI and where, you know, the good, the bad and the overhyped. So I'll do that for data professional, data related type workloads. So that's data engineering, data analysis. I'll get into as a programmer, what seems to work really well, um, what's kind of short there as a founder, you get to touch pretty much every area of business. So things like legal sales, marketing, all the not so fun stuff operations. So there I was able to try AI to support me and getting better at a lot of these things. So I'll talk about that. And a big part of how I spend my time is that as an open source maintainer. So kind of what we found there in terms of the AI tooling, I have a few gripes, like things that are kind of annoying with AI right now, I hope get addressed soon and a bit of a what's next to finish. So this is like how we got here. Well, I took a lot at this point of this slide. I'm not going to go everywhere here, but, uh, the point is it took a while to accumulate all the things. Like it's a complex, uh, is it a DAG kind of, well, it's a complex series of events that got us to generative AI today. I'm not going to point to too many things, but I wanted to point at the things that are more directly related to what allowed for, you know, getting us to GPT-3.5. So advances in neural network topologies and, and just like accessibility of neural networks, right? Like 10, 10 years ago, you didn't have like all the PyTorch and all the things so that anyone in this room could go and play with neural nets. So the fact it became accessible, allowed for all sorts of new topologies and new type of neural networks and kind of accessibility to these, uh, neural networks. The internet as a public, uh, massive data set, public data set without that data set, make it easy for anyone to take that data and train, uh, these LLMs, we couldn't do it right. 20 years ago, there's not, you know, Wikipedia was probably, uh, shadow of what it is today. So that, that was a really important thing. That's part of this convergence, the compute power explosion, kind of big data, big data center, uh, massive data companies, advances in GPU, CPU, Moore's law in general, got to a critical mass recently, uh, the transformer architecture, that's kind of something interesting if you haven't heard of it, but that's a breakthrough that happened at. I believe in the lab at Google around 2017 is when they found the transformer. Stuff that's beyond, like, I don't understand how they work, but I know they're important. They're a key ingredient to that recipe. And then the two things I think that are a little bit sur surprising was the unsupervised learning breakthrough through this idea of predicting the next word. I think you would have told people about 10 years ago that predicting the next word was going to be the way that we're going to get reasoning come out of neural network. You would have been like, wait, there's so much you can do predicting the next word, but uh, somehow that works and that uh, that's uh, seems to be the main path forward now okay so this is less of a, a this is an aside on the talk but something I, I wanted to mention i realized recently is that for this new critical innovation technology open source 
right out the gate is one of the leaders, right? Llama is like, like yeah, Llama and, you know, GP, the latest GPT are like kind of head to head. Some of the advances we've seen were open source first. Open source historically has been trying to catch the, to play catch up with the vendor tools. And that's no longer the case. A lot of uh, innovation comes straight out of the gate, open source now. And certainly in AI, what we're seeing now is that we're one, like open source versus vendors is like horse number two or one, depending on uh, the latest release. So that's some, that's a trend I think that's interesting. And that's great because of the accessibility to, uh, you know, to, to the world at large, it's not just going to be open AI making trillions, selling their tech to other people. All right, so now we get into use cases, which is really what like, the, the goal of this talk is to, is to share my experience working with AI every day and kind of qualifying what works and what doesn't. This is just my experience too. Like other people's experiences may vary. Things are changing extremely fast, uh, but still like, let's get into it. Um, and I'll be around at happy hour curse like, how people have had, where people have had success or failure trying to get value out of AI. All right, so I'm going category by category. So the first one is as a data practitioner, which uh, data professional, data prof uh, practitioner. So this is like the data analyst, data engineering type workflow, people working in data teams. All right, so for each one of, of these persona or type of use cases, I'm going to talk about the good, the bad, the overhyped, these things are in flux, may change very quickly. At Preset, we've built, built something on top of open source superset that's called AI Assist. So we have a SQL IDE. I'll have a slide on that in a moment, but this, uh, th this is able to kind of fetch your data models and then take a prompt and generate SQL. And I've discovered that AI is really good at SQL, especially not, not if it doesn't know the, if it doesn't know your database, um, or it doesn't know your models. Uh, or there's a now the dialect that you're operating in it might not do that well but if you put all the stuff you need in the prompt like here's a bunch of tables and a schema now can you generate a query that computes nrr over time this and that and you have good naming conventions and documentation it can do extremely well at that uh, scripting acceleration is as data engineers, I'm sure like a lot of you like write little scripts here and there, sometimes throw away scripts, sometimes a trip, uh, a strip you put in a repo, but for a contained script that does something specific you need to do that, to, you need to accomplish that day, you can get from zero to 80% and, and about five minutes if you're not a prompt. The few iteration, you can create these scripts very, very quickly, which has been refreshing, uh, you know, it's just instead of taking Something that that might that might take an hour and a half before might take like twelve minutes now, and that changes the economics of like is it even worth it to write this script um, in the first place? Here I wrote as an advisor on approach. So, so you know sometimes you'd go to like a senior engineer's desk in your team and ask her, uh, ask him like, hey, I'm trying to work on this thing, but I don't know how to approach it. I don't know what kind of data modeling I should do or I'm trying to set new naming convention. I don't know how about it. I don't know how to go about it. And for that, I think AI can be a really good advisor to kind of help you set an approach. Suggesting code snippet, if you're like, instead of looking at the documentation to like, how do you do date trunk and BigQuery? It's a little plus, you know, like you can get a very clear answer on that. There might be some uh, hallucination, but these little code snippets are great. Ideating, advising, KPI, um, industry standards, that goes a little bit with advisor on approach is solid. And then like data modeling is, it's really good at, I've got an example of that in just a moment. That bad stuff is like anything that requires context that does not exist on the public internet, right? So if you're trying to work on a task that requires tribal knowledge from within your company, that requires to deeply know your schema or your naming convention, and you don't put that in the prompt, the more you require context, the less AI can help you. That's pretty clear. The overhyped, which, you know, we might still deliver on these, but the Alice agent of like, oh, we don't need data Alice, just ask an AI and it's going to figure out, like it's going to, you know, I don't know, talk to the data dictionary, generate a query, build a dashboard for you. Essentially anything that requires executive skills or training like a DAG of action 
right? Where a human might do a little search, ask, ask a coworker, maybe do a little bit more research here and there, you know, go, go look at code in a repo and then come up with an answer. Anything that requires chaining of action that doesn't fit in a prompt, it sucks at. Rags, I'm not sure how familiar people are with the term. So, uh, it's retrie retrieval augmented generation. So it's the idea of fetching the context that you need for the prompt. So for text to SQL that I've been talking about as an example is RAG will go and fetch the schema of the tables you might want to query prior to asking to, um, to, to generate SQL, right? So here's a bunch of tables that might be useful. Now, can you write a query that computes this or that? Um, so these RAG, those are integration and that's typically what we've seen when application integrate AI, they typically use the RAG methodology and those products are super new. I think they're very promising, but the implementations are a little bit clunky still, at least in my experience. Code interpreter, that is an open AI feature, bit of a hit or miss, may help, may kind of get you out of the way. Um, and again, you'll see that on every one of these slides, anything that requires executive skill or chaining a complex set of events, things that are related to what typically we would think an agent would do. Uh, I would say anything agent related is uh, over hype at this time or short and arrival. Well, so this one is a specific use, uh, instance of RAG that happens to work well. So, so for me and my experience, the AI assist we've built at Preset inside inside our SQL IDE works really well because it's deterministic and we, we manage to provide all the right context for the query. But I think this kind of rag might be some of the coding assistants that are trying to index your entire repo. Um, there's also, so, but I think in general rag is over high, but it's starting to show promises and it might, there might be some areas where it can be well applied. There's some areas where the context is heterogeneous coming from different sources and you have only part of that context. Maybe you're missing trout. Yeah. In, in theory, the analyst agent, if that agent had access to your entire data, data dictionary, all your documentation, all of your GitHub source code and had been trained on all of that or was ragging all that information properly it could work very well, but like right now, these products are like six months old. They've been kind of slapped together quickly. So we're still early in that. So it's not over hyped as in it will never deliver. It's like, it's promising. It's look like it's going to be good. There, there may be some magical moments. It demos very well in a control demo setting, but then you try to use it and, and you're like, what, you know, what is this stuff? But yeah, there, there's some contradiction here that you might see some more. So this is what a, AI assist looks like in superset. Like it indexes the, your whole schema, your whole database. You ask like all sorts of, you know, questions that generates SQL and runs it. This is another example of like, I was just, for some reason, I think I needed, we created a new environment. So we have like staging prod, but we're creating a sandbox environment. I needed to copy a bunch of tables. I was like, can you show me an easy way to clone the table structures from a schema to another and a short conversation and, you know, generally a little script for me that worked well. Uh, this one, this one is more abstract. So I wrote this blog post. I said, this talk could have been about this topic. It's like da a data modeling type topic and a blog post related to that. But like this blog post was written in type cal collaboration with, uh, with AI. So I had like a bunch of ideas in my head. Maybe not the exact right naming for it. For, for me as a English as second language, it can be hard to like write really good blog posts. It takes me a lot of time and effort. But in this case, I was able to write this blog post. Juggling these extremely complex like data modeling concepts, right? So this is like as an alternative complementary, complementary, if you're familiar with, uh, dimensional modeling and star schemas, this is like kind of like this level of abstraction complexity. And I was able to. I DA'd very, very effectively, uh, with AI and it was like, 
probably as good as if I could have had time with uh, Ralph Kimball and Bill Emmon, like the kind of grandfather data warehousing. Like if I could have sat down with them and have conversation, like AI was just as good as that, as, uh, as, as this might have been, right? So really good at juggling with these abstract comple uh, complex ideas, kind of, uh, call it kind of mashing ideas together and being a sounding board for, for someone like me who had a bunch of thoughts about this. All right. As a software engineer here, you can look at all the AI generated images here. I forgot, should I put the prompt? It'd be interesting. Like what prompt I used to get that generated. Let's see. So things that work well, autocomplete, like who here uses GitHub autopilot, something like Codium every day. Like if you don't, like just, if you code, like just go buy the stuff, it, it, you write three letters and the, Programming now is just about hitting tab if you're doing it right. And, but if in, sometimes it's just right, like you're in Python, you write like def for a function and it knows, it's like, how did it know which function I wanted to write? And then you just write the header and it writes the right parameters. Then you change the parameters, it changes the code. And if you, if you do it well too, like you add the right doc string, it might not get like what you're trying to do, but like you start writing a doc string and then it will write the function. Uh, so you're like, tab and done like this is a uh, there's some magic in here there's some shortcoming it works very well within the confine of a module so if you have a large module that's well contained my experience is like if it refers to other modules that are not kind of in memory at that time it may not work as well i mean maybe some of these tools are able to go and, and fetch their reference and kind of bring them in context i also found that it works very well with a functional programming or functional programming like approach Having data engineers in the room more than software engineers, people might not be as familiar with the, the paradigm, but uh, fun functional programming is is more of a an approach where you know you use function. They don't have side effect. They're well contained. They're idempotent. They have a kind of guaranteed result. And in this style of programming, AI is much better at than object oriented programming. And in my experience, it kind of gets really confused about basic inheritance type scheme. In the same way that maybe oh, object-oriented programming is not that great of a paradigm for humans too, because people should be used to. There's a lot of bugs related to inheritance and that kind of stuff. So, uh, so that's something if you are able to code more in a functional kind of way, it's going to be easier to leverage the power of AI, at least in this phase. Refactoring. So we've done a like, super says massive code base, thousands of modules. We have these big migration, the JavaScript to TypeScript, adding ty type hints, you know, doing migration from, from a thing to another, or even like linting and things like that. It's really good at that. Uh, translating from language to language. I wrote a script and like JavaScript and I was like, oh, it should be, it should have been in Python and it just translated, it just worked out of the box. You know, like who hears, who here, uh, is not too big on writing unit, unit tests or doesn't really like yeah some people love it some people are like test driven development you know you can see it from the history of airflow not a lot of uh, unit tests in the first uh, few years so that's my fault but uh if i'd had ai at the time i might have created a lot more a lot more unit tests it's really it can be really good on that especially if you have code with no side effects and for functional programming type unit tests it's really good at naming things. Apparently the second most, the hardest thing in software engineering. I don't believe that, but, uh, people have said that. So. Can't be that hard if uh, AI is able to do it. All right. Uh, let's see bad. Anything that requires deep or wide context again. So we'll see the same stuff in the, the overhype that programmer agent doesn't work as well. Anything that requires chaining multiple tasks or executive skills. Oh yeah. Have you noticed too, like when it, like. When you try to use an API, like you, you, you with AI, it will just kind of hallucinate. It's like, oh, you know, it would be like, can you write an Airflow thing that will add, you know, six database connection with these parameters? It will just invent an API that should exist. It's like, it's like designing it. <laughs> so I'm like, yeah, oh yeah, that's a great, I'll get, I'll get to it in a gripe a little bit later. I wrote an open source project at some point where we were working on AI assist. It's called Promptimize. It's like test driven development applied to prompt engineering. And I would say like 80 to 90% of the readme, the logo, the code, 
getting to a working state. Uh, that was my first project that was like 100% AI assisted and it probably did 80% of the work. You know, it's, it's just like, you just kind of vomit a prompt and it generates good stuff and you copy paste it in the right place. So, so for fresh new projects and core structure, if you prompt it right, you'll get good stuff. All right, as a startup founder, I'm, I'm gonna pick up the pace a little bit. This thing is so good at marketing and product marketing and generating campaigns. It's crazy. And the spam and the targeting is only going to get worse in your inbox because it's so easy now to do that and do that well. I don't have a co-founder, so it can be really good judgment and free thought partner, advisor slash uh, founder therapist at time. Um, so comms advice, legal advice, I would, I would not use it for official legal stuff where you can prep, I think my legal bills. Um, as a startup founder, I've gone down probably 60 to 80% since uh, I use ChatGPT. Uh, the bad thing is, unfortunately, it cannot run my company or I would not be here. I'd be sipping Mai Tai somewhere. Um, and then <laughs> overhype, I can't do much of the things that uh, require executive skills. It's also like, as a founder, I don't feel like, oh, I could, you know, fire ha half the engineer and double the productivity, like we're, we're far from being there. So we've seen like gain in productivity, you know, it's hard to measure, but there's always so much work in startups. All right. So that was a customer email that I needed to generate people abusing our terms of service. So instead of like, you know, taking an hour to craft the perfect email, it's like, it takes three minutes. You're like, people are abusing our terms of service. Can you help me write an email bank? All right, so this one is open source maintainer, GitHub user. There's some interesting stuff. So we started using recently what's good, what's bad, and overhyped, bots, bots, bots. So we got bots. We got three Slack bots. We got two issue bot. We got PR bot now. Uh, something really interesting is being an open source project, we might be able to uh, receive from that gift a lot more than pro property vendor. So the fact that everything's in the open, then that means that the bots can be unleashed and anyone can finance a bot. So in, in this case here, you could have Astronomer, AWS, Google financing and you know, paying for some bots to come and improve the airflow repository, right? It's all in the open, everything's available. So that is, that is a super cool thing. And I've got an example of, uh, oh, that, I'm gonna skip this one. That was like, I had to deal with some ASF nonsense it helps it help you write uh, write an email, but uh, this this is like bots answering issues. So this guy's like, oh, you know, I'm having this this issue with a SQL query mutator. Then this this you summon this Dosu bot. So the, this stuff index your entire repo, your documentation, whatever w website you point it to, maybe some. Um, uh, Stack Overflow topics, right? That index all the stuff. It, it trains and it rags this stuff. So it puts all that stuff in the vector database. And then we had the uh, Markley, I don't know who that is, but it's like, that actually worked. This is the first time I've been impressed with AI. So in an issue, so first it's first wall of defense, right? As a maintainer, you keep like answering issues and saying the same questions, pointing to documentation. Uh, we have another thing called Kappa AI, Run LLM. I pair some other one. We have a channel called Ask AI on the Superset Slack, and they people go ask questions, and the bots are just talking with one another, offering solutions, and then people are engaging, and it, it works. So that's been great. Here, this is an example of someone you can kind of see it up here, asking a question in some language I can't identify. In any case, it doesn't matter. But I, the bot responded in English. I've seen the bot respond in other languages too. Someone asks a question in Spanish. It answers in Spanish. And these are all like just tons of instances of using Dosu that just worked. So people are just like, oh my God, this worked. I think uh, that's, that's something that's interesting to have but collaborators. I'm getting almost to the end here. So some grapes, like has anyone noticed, like, is it me or I feel like I've heard people complain about that, but as GPT 4.0 like gotten worse over time, maybe it's the alignment or maybe our expectations are evolving, <laughs> but it's been, it's been a, a little tough at times. Um, uh, seems like it's been getting worse from my perspective. Uh, GPT is incredibly verbose. You ask like a small question and it writes a long, like shut the fuck up. Like, I don't care. 
Like, yeah, just tell me the line of code. I asked you, like, how can you write a book from that small of a question? This is not a dissertation. And I changed my settings. You can change your, your kind of main prompt that goes into all your sessions. And I'm like, I want something consistent. Like, I, I want something um, very short and direct. And when you write code, like, don't rewrite the whole thing. Just write what you change. And, but uh, it, it won't listen. It wants to talk and talk. And it one shots all the time. Like it's as if anytime you type something, you're like, he's like, oh, we're not having a conversation here. I'm, this is my last chance to say everything I know. And, uh, and then sometimes you copy paste the wrong thing. Like you're having a conversation, you copy paste the wrong thing that has nothing to do with it, but it's still, it, instead of telling you like, wait, I think, I think you're confused or what's going on. It will ju it will just like take that as granted and be like, oh. Sure, we're talking about this now. So I think it, it needs to be a little bit more human in that way of like, what did you mean by that? Or would you like me to, you know, look at it, look at it in this way or in this other way? And then, yeah, so I think another thing that I think has improved a little bit slight, slightly lately is it always wants to answer from its own neural network and wait as if I would, if I ask any of you guys like, hey, I really need your help. I'm trying to write my first DAG. It's about this or that. I'm not sure which operators to use. You would probably take your laptop and say, I'm going to do a few Google search, you know, and put something together and, and then uh, we can look at it together. AI really often tries to answer from its own model. A perplexity has changed. I think, um, in some cases, uh, chat GPT, if you pay for it, it, it will, it might do a Google search, but you have to ask it very explicitly. Hey, go research this. Like, don't answer from memory. You're, you know, you're most likely hallucinating. Or I know you're hallucinating. Go read the docs and API docs and then provide an answer. That's what any engineer in their right mind would do, you know? So, I mean, th th this is probably like just fine tuning and prompting, but uh, that's what we've seen. So wrapping, racket, wrapping up this talk, and then we can all go have a drink, finally. Uh, but I, so, Few thoughts I think are interested. So, super cliche thing to say. This is the first NA, which is the beginning of it. Like you know, we need to give it a moment. This this talk is already obsolete, but it, we are early, right? One concern I think that's really interesting that no one has an answer to is this: their limits, kind of ceiling to intelligence overall. Like maybe human intelligence is not that far from. Top intelligence, though I doubt it. Uh, looking at what uh, what I see every day in the in the world with all the humans, but that might be a theoretical uh, limit to intelligence, to computation, to or to energy. People are saying that even if all the H one hundred or whatever the, the the new GPUs are called that people are buying left and right, if we were to de if they were to deliver them by the truck, we would there would not be enough energy on the grid to power all of that. So that might become one of the limiting factors. But who cares? Because I think we've done enough advances that if we're just to capitalize on the technology improvements we've done, we could still have like a really massive impact in the world with the technology as it is uh, today. If we're stuck with GPT four O for the rest for the next decade, there will still be a cultural share and a kind of figuring out how to leverage that technology best to improve our workflows and our lives. Let's see what else I have to say. Rag is promising, but clunky. Trust is an issue and lagging. Like you get hallucinated on a few times, you get bad answers a few times, and then you step back. So it's going to take a while to build trust and then Great for creative workflow, not so good where correctness matters. I would not trust, you know, an AI to say, go compute my net sales uh, growth month over month, and then take that to the CEO. I think that's my board meeting. Uh, but to say, if you say like, hey, tell me what's a good approach to compute this kind of stuff, um, something more creative, advice works well. And then I mentioned that earlier, then that is my very last point outside the let's go get a drink. It is. Um, if you have not developed this first reflex, if you don't have like, I would say five to 20 sessions with AI every day, you might be missing out on kind of surfing the wave. And uh, part of the first people 
that will get a, a performance acceleration boost in their daily workflow productivity and career. So I encourage people to, to do that. There's two angles to that. Being more productive is one. The other one is like staying on top of understanding how AI and the world is evolving. That's what I got here.